Hello, welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe, and uh, we're recording here in the middle of the day Thursday, so, uh, you know, week's not done, market's up on the week, nothing dramatic. It actually has been kind of a boring week in the markets, which is, is interesting for a lot of people because it has not been a boring week in the news cycle, um, and I think it's one of those weeks that is a pretty good reinforcement of how disconnected uh, markets are from from the news cycle often. In this particular case, you had a lot of drama and flair and, and whatever. I, I don't even want to get into it, to be honest with you. On uh, the president's trip to Helsinki and the summit with Russian President Vladimir Putin. So the comments that were made in that press conference, they dominated most of the news this week. But uh, the fact of the matter is that the um, market was up most days. And when it was down, it's down a little today, not, not a lot. So we'll see how the market ends up. But overall, positive week, and it's been a very positive uh, month in terms of uh, equity markets. And of course, the earnings season is very fresh and young. Um, it's going to get real hot and heavy next week and the week after. Uh, it's the peak of earnings season. But for now, so far, so good. There's been a couple companies that had some disappointments, and their stocks were treated accordingly. But some other ones have just had gangbuster results. Uh, but way too early to get an aggregate feel for top line revenue growth, which is what I'm looking at the most. Of course, we look at the bottom line earnings growth as well, but we we don't think there's a lot of question. It's going to be very good. But what is more of a potential un, uh, a potential unexpected positive catalyst is if top line revenue growth, which is itself unrelated, obviously, to tax reform, ends up moving markets higher. So in terms of a couple of things I just want to comment on, this, this theme that we've had about value over growth, uh, I, don't, I, I always have to reiterate, I don't like the terms at all, okay? I, I, any stock someone wants to buy as a long-term investment should have a value component to it, meaning you don't want to be overpaying. You want it to be at a value in what you're paying for it. You like the price relative to what the return you expect to get is. Um, and then as far as growth, I don't know why you'd ever buy a company that you don't believe is going to be growing. And yet the industry has used the terms often simplistically to refer to value as way out of favor companies. That's not always accurate. And growth as just high flying companies, which also isn't accurate. Fact of the matter is that you have five companies right now in the S&P 500. They happen to be Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, and uh, excuse me, Facebook, Amazon, um, uh, what am I missing here? Google, Microsoft, that represent $4.1 trillion of market capitalization. And you have 282 companies in the S&P 500 that represent $4.1 trillion of market capitalization. The bottom 282 companies have the same weighting in the index as the top five. So that's how much these growth companies have, uh, their size has become a very disproportionate impact across the index that has a number of distortive elements to it, either on the upside or potentially downside. Um, I, I believe right now a lot of growth names uh, especially new tech, or we call them cool tech companies in the technology sector, to be bought, have to be bought because you believe that you can uh, time and exit, or you believe that more and more people will just keep coming in and therefore keep bidding the stock up, the momentum factor, and that tree will keep growing right on through the sky. Um, so that's fine. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's not what we do. It's not what we believe in doing. It's not what we encourage investors to do. It's not to say other people can't do it. Um, I don't meet a lot of those people um, or I meet them and hear about their incredible success stories um, and I don't get to hear about anything else uh, and, you know, the story there. Value to me represents a sustainable long-term opportunity of a company that can create uh, a result that is not dependent on one of those factors of timing or perpetual momentum. That there's a company that is uh, bought at an attractive price relative to what you ex its expected cash flow growth will be. And of course we measure that through the growth of the dividend and their ability to continue returning cash to shareholders. 
So the value of a growth theme is not dependent on us uh, having a belief that growth is about to underperform. I have no idea. Growth can crush it another three months, six months, whatever it may be. I have no idea. Um, it may not last another day. All I know is on a risk-reward basis, we believe that there is an opportunity in more reasonable, fundamentally defensible companies. That's what we are focusing on buying right now. Um, the appetite for stocks and the volatility around it is largely going to depend on where the trade war stuff goes and how those things are able to de-escalate and unwind. And I think that there will be some more volatility. I don't expect that the worst of the trade war stuff is over. I think it will be over. And I think the worst part of it will end up being volatility, not a new secular repricing of assets. But until we have resolution, that can't be said as a foregone conclusion. And then I think the other piece that, that hangs over markets still, of course, is the normalization of Federal Reserve monetary policy. And this is where my skepticism about high growth companies comes in. Just indiscriminate buying of all risk assets and of buying these passive index funds that are heavily weighted and creating this sort of feedback loop of benefit to uh, four or five different stocks. I think that ride is, is coming to an end, that the Federal Reserve, as they normalize, it makes um, selectivity in the stock picking process far more important. And that the kind of everything goes up, but growth goes up the most environment that was largely helped by the bid put into markets and risk assets by accommodative monetary policy. I think that seasonally we're adjusting and moving and transitioning out of that. So those are our themes right now. It's our thoughts around uh, growth and value, the market overall, Federal Reserve, trade war. And then I guess the final comment I make is on the energy pipeline sector. Very big uh, newsworthy and market impacting events. You see the MLP sector rallying today. The FERC uh, gave their final ruling on, on specific tax implications from the new tax bill to pass through entities like pipelines. And, they, and it was much softer than it had been kind of telegraphed back in March. And so there's some relief out of that as well. Not to mention just overall a lot of great performance. And as that secular trend of the midstream pipelines being so needed is getting a little bit more respect. A long way to go in that story. But from being down, you know, mid double digits on the year, 15, 16%. To now be uh, you know substantially up on the year, it's been a big comeback, and uh, still deeply underpriced in our opinion in that in that sector uh, will play out for years to come. Okay, so we covered a lot of territory today. I gotta let this go uh, and and reach out anytime any questions. Thank you for listening, Dividend Cafe. We'll be back at you next week as always. Have a great weekend.